let's dive right in. Uh, wait, what shirt are you wearing today? Is this a... Black flag. Oh, okay. Are you a fan of them? I am, yeah. Yeah, so you like not only metal, you like punk, you like Tribe Called Quest. Like, you have all these different musical influences. Yeah, I like it all. How did that start? Like, who got you in? That's what I've always wondered. Because I would see in, like, Slayer shirts and the press conferences and things, and I'm like, how did you get into all these older bands? So uh, when I was a kid, the story basically goes when I was a kid, I I went over to my neighbor's house, um, and my neighbor had Guitar Hero 2, I think it was. Um, so I remember watching him play, and I was like, well, that's kind of cool. I wonder what that's about. Um, and then so I was like telling my parents, like, I want that. I want that game. And then that was around the time uh, Guitar Hero 3 was about to come out. So my parents got me a Guitar Hero 3 on the Wii. And I was like constantly, constantly playing that. And like, I hadn't been, I wasn't like a music guy before because I was in like second, second or third grade at the time, right? So I didn't really know. And then I, um, so I was remembering all these songs and I was like, you know, I liked them and I was like, okay, well, I want to try to play this for real. So I was like pestering my parents to get me a real guitar for about a year. Uh, and they wouldn't do it just because they were like, you're not gonna, you're not gonna stick with it, blah, 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 whatever. And then on my, my 10th, I think my 10th birthday was, um, they got me, they got me my first guitar, uh, and I didn't play it. They were right. I didn't play because I didn't know how to. Um, and then like, <clears throat> but I guess as I continue to get older, uh, with those, with the influence from the songs that I found on like Guitar Hero 2 that I liked, I just kept on like listening to stuff like that. Okay. So yeah. So then you just got really into music, but while at the same time you're doing sports and having dreams of the NFL, but I heard you say that you were you started out more as a basketball player, and that was kind of was that a dream too to do the NBA? Yeah, I mean, I always thought that I'd be because basketball was like my first like real love. Don't don't get me wrong, I loved I loved football as a kid, and then like but like as I got older, like the football teams I was playing for, I wasn't really having that much fun with it. So um, I liked football and basketball, and I was always I was pretty good at basketball. I was a good basketball player, and you know I did the whole like AAU travel team and stuff like that did all that and was decent enough to like get some looks. Um, but as I got older, uh, basketball just became less fun for me. Um, combination of like, I guess being around the wrong coaches and basketball is not really a team sport necessarily. Um, and in high school, I was really trying to see if I could go to college for basketball, but at the same time, like football started ramping up for me. Um, and then it got to the point where it was like, no, the football thing is like my thing and this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. So because you started out in football as a tight end and a defensive end. So when did they they switch or they switch you? It was a, your senior year to left tackle. Is that right? Yeah, it was more like the um, like I had always wanted to, when I started, like wanting to play football. I was like, no, I'm going to be a tight end. Like if I play football, I would be a tight end. Like that's the position that I wanted to do. I played tight end growing up and. Um, defensive end as well, but I like tight end and, uh, going into my, going into my senior year, it was like the, uh, our, we didn't really use our tight end too much in high school. So it was, it was, it was just kind of like, okay, well, this isn't really going to do anything for me. So I remember telling my coach, like, it's like, Hey, like if it's for the good of the team, I'll move to left tackle. I'll just do it. You know, I know, I know the O-line coach wants it. Um, I still know my online coach today are still pretty good friends, but, it was basically just like, yeah, like I'm all yours, coach. Just, you know, teach me the ways of, of tackle and I'll, I'll do it. Like, I don't have to be tight end anymore. I'll just, I'll give that up and we'll see what happens. And it worked. <laughs> yeah. Cause what did you, what was the award you got? Like it was a USA Today, like second team all state or what, what was the thing that they gave you? I don't remember exactly what it was. I just remember like my, my senior year things really started to pick up like recruiting wise for me. I'd never really been recruited. Um, but when it really kind of got going and I got a couple of like it really started to get going. So I remember like it was like me and like a bunch of other high school athletes from like around the uh, Pacific Northwest. We like met at this place and took some pictures and we got like like you said, like these different awards and stuff that they give out to like, you know, I guess top top kids they considered to be the best in high school. So, yeah, well, what, one of those persons uh, must have been your, your teammate, uh, Kyler Gordon. Did he get some of that stuff, too? Oh, accolades. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I mean, he he probably in the last, really in the last like I guess decade of Murphy, Archbishop Murphy football was probably the most highly recruited, highly sought after guy. 
And, you know, if I remember watching him train and watching him do like box jumps and stuff. And it was like, yeah, this makes sense for a guy who can do this sort of thing as well as he can. Just crazy athletic ability. And, you know, it makes sense that he went um, went in the second round in 2022, you know. Yeah. So then when you uh, get recruited, you're you're how you had offers from also Oregon State and Wyoming. So what made you pick Wazoo? Is it because they talked about your potential, how they saw that you had potential to gain weight and get stronger? Uh, honestly, like, I just kind of, I mean, I didn't really know too much about, like, uh, techniques and, like, the whole college experience or even really lifting weights at that point. I took a visit to Wazoo, and I just liked it. So I was kind of like, okay, like, I could see myself here, and, you know, I'm getting to go to school and – you know, so really, I didn't really need much convincing, so to speak, because I knew the work was going to have to be done. I just didn't know what that was going to look like. Um, and then Wazoo was in the state, right? And it's close enough to where if I absolutely needed to go home, I could go home, but also far enough away to where I felt like, you know, I'm kind of living my own life, sort of, so to speak. Yeah, you had a buffer zone. That's always nice <laughs> to have. So I'm assuming you got mostly recruited from the O-line coach, or was it Coach Mele, I think? Yeah, Mele was a big recruiter for me. Yeah, but so then eventually you had to have met Mike Leach. So tell oh, yeah. me about your first interaction with him because he's he's such a character. I mean, there had to have been some memorable things that he did. So my first interaction wasn't even really my interaction. And what I mean by that is um, I was on my official visit, right? And I I was the last one to meet with him out of all the guys that were visiting. It was me and my, my parents, and he was bringing people in, talking to them for like 15 minutes or whatever. You know how Leach is, he kind of um, would just kind of drag on. So it was taking longer than it should have because he was probably talking to them about some other stuff. And he, uh, so he calls me on the last one. Um, and my mom and him immediately just like hit it off right away. Because um, there was like some, there was, there was like some, um, some plaque in there. And he was like, I can't remember who exactly it was, but he was like, had a picture with them. And my mom was like, what's, you know, what's the story with this? And he's like, oh, let me tell you about that. So they started talking about this. I uh, started talking about pirates, uh, started talking about Native American, uh, Geronimo. And then we passed by this picture on his desk of like an, of Texas Tech's O-line like blocking. And he just goes really quickly. He stops and goes, oh, hey, yeah, Abe, this is you right here just blocking people. OK, anyways, back to what I was talking about. So that was really the only thing that he kind of said to me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like, it wasn't even about football. It was just like, hey, like, I wrote a book. Oh, hey, here's the time I talked to Donald Trump about something, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it was really funny. It just, I was just kind of sitting there like, okay, like, <laughs> this is kind of weird, but it's kind of cool. That's hilarious. That's that's the perfect Mike Leach introduction. I love it. So that you knew, like, this is going to be a good fit, though. This is a guy's a character, and yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so then... Talk about this. Is, I find this so fascinating because I'm just always obsessed with people's success and like how they get there. You're playing for the Seahawks. Now you're starting. You start as a rookie. But you said it was in college that you really learned how to develop your work ethic. Like your strength and conditioning coach in college says you, you you'd beat him to the weight room. You go to the mm -hmm. weight room at 530 in the morning before you can even unlock the door. You're outside waiting. Mm -hmm. Like, how did where did that come from? Did, where did you get that work ethic? Because it sounds like you said you developed it in college. So. Did you, I mean, you must've worked hard in high school too. Uh, I know a lot of people would probably disagree with you. Um, oh. <laughs> I, it wasn't a question of, I, I was never like a problem guy. Like I never, you know, I never got in trouble with like the law or anything like that. It just was like, to me, like in high school, I thought this is just like preconceived notions of stuff, but I thought like practicing was kind of a waste of time. I thought that lifting was kind of a waste just because it was just like, it doesn't, like, I mean, this high school, we're playing games and blah, blah, blah. You know, it, like, didn't really matter that much in terms of, like, developing my craft, so to speak. And then when I got to college, like, you know, I, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, but, like, that first week there when we were doing, like, running, and so I was kind of like, holy shit, like, this is how it's going to be, like, the entire time. You know, like, I'm, I'm going to have to – I'm going to have to come and bring this type of energy every single day. And it was kind of like, it was very much like a sensory overload type thing. And actually what happened was at the end of our first week, I mean, our freshmen or the freshmen there, we'd just gotten our asses kicked like the entire week, just because like nobody was used to this level of conditioning or weightlifting or whatever. And they called, they called me and were like, Hey, you need to come, come into the weight room. Uh, 
um, and meet with the, the head guy. Now we hadn't been working out with the head guy yet. Um, and the head guy was a dude, like he was, I mean, we had only been there a week and everybody was already scared shitless of him, you know, just from what we had heard about him. Um, so I came in there and, and they were, and we had been training with one of the assistant guys and, uh, the assistant strength coach, he had been super loud and super yelly with us, you know, it's like yelling us, telling us to be on our, like that whole first week. Um, but you know, sitting in that office in front of the head man, he was quiet, you know? So I was like, Oh damn, like this is for real. And the head guy basically told me like, um, the coaches that you've been working with say that you're the worst one out of this bunch right now. Like you're the worst guy out of this, in terms of like your attitude, your effort and your intensity level and blah, 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 blah. And so he was basically like, you suck. You need to get your shit together. I mean, he didn't, he actually said like, you know, more non PC things than that in the, uh, okay, in the wow. but it was just more or less like, you know, you need to show up or I'm going to run you off this team essentially. And so I left there. I remember leaving there and I was just kind of like, cause like I was, I was kind of in shock that I was considered to be one of the worst guys because I didn't think that what I had done that first week was that bad. But, and so they told me that. And I, I remember going home and I was like, okay, it's time to put up, you know what I mean? And so like the switch kind of flipped for me right there. So you know, we'd have a workout at, we'd have a workout at 6 a.m. or like a run at 6 a.m. I'd be there at 4 a.m. Like that was just my thing. I was like, okay, I'm gonna get there early. Like that's what I'm going to do. And it kind of, and it became like consistent and it became a habit. And I was, I was scared to lift and I was scared to let these guys down because I had a lot of respect for them, you know, and then it turned over from, Hey, you're one of the worst guys to, Hey, like you're a guy who's on top of his shit. And I'm like, good. Like that's how it should be. And then of course, there were the other lessons that came along with that. You know, we started working out with the head guy and he was, like I said, he was a dude. He taught me so much just through lifting weights about working hard and doing what you're supposed to do and being a man and everything like that. So through all of that, like that's where it kind of like the switch flipped for me and, and the potential that I had started to come out more. Interesting. So it sounds like in high school, in a way, you were kind of able to coast off your talent. Course, and then when yeah. you got to Wazoo, it was like you had to step up your game. And, and mm -hmm. like you said, the switch just clicked. Absolutely. Yeah, that's funny. So did you um, tell me about being a freshman, too, though, because there was a little bit of hazing. Did they did the other teammates shave your head? They cut. Yeah, they cut my hair. That And, you know, that was honestly probably the best thing they could have done. Some other teams go crazy with hazing stuff. All they did was they shaved my head and they made me go to class the next day and show it off to everybody. It was actually pretty funny. Okay, so nothing too bad because I know there's like some there's some stuff about that in the news about hazing and I feel like that's pretty tame compared to other schools. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So then, how do you um, you gain 21 pounds in your first two weeks in your first summer there? How mm -hmm. and how do you put the weight on in a healthy way? Because that's the goal. You want to put on the weight. You don't want to get just fat. You want to put on muscle, which it looks like that's clearly what you did. How did you do that? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was. Uh... Well, first, let me say this. Everybody's body type is pretty different. Um, some people can put on weight and lose weight very, very easily. I'm one of those people to where if I don't eat like a certain type of food for a day, I can lose eight pounds just like that. And I can also put on eight pounds just like that. Some other people, it takes them like um, Buddy Andre, who played left tackle. It took him four years to gain or to move up from the same weight that I was to the, to the weight that he ended up playing at his senior year, you know? So for everybody, it's very, very different. Mine took me probably a little less than a year to like get to my goal playing weight. And part of that, I mean, the main thing obviously is lifting. Uh, I worked out, you know, every single day, obviously. Um, and then uh, the food that they served us was really, really good. Not super like junky or anything like that. So that also helps. And really, it's just a combination of both of that and continuing continuing to stay up on that. Is it a lot of protein too? Do you yeah. have to track uh, it? Uh, they, um, they did a good job like nutrition wise of helping us to track those sorts of things. Um, and a lot of it fell on us, to be honest, just like, hey, like be on top of your stuff, because that was really kind of that's really kind of the thing, right? Like you're now essentially you're not a professional, but you're expected to act like one. Um, so it's like, hey, if you know you're supposed to be at a goal weight, a good, healthy goal weight, then you know the types of food that you need to eat to be at this healthy goal weight rather than eating, a, say, a different type of food and being overweight, underweight or at a bad sloppy weight, you know? So do you just um, eat certain foods and avoid other foods or do you actually track all your calories in an, in an app or something? 
I've I've done both before. I'm pretty lucky to where I can kind of eat whatever I want to eat. Um, and you know, it kind of stays on pretty, pretty good. Um, I've been, I remember my senior year, I went on a diet for like, um, six months or so. I ate the same thing every day just because I wanted to see how it would change my body. And it changed a little bit. Um, but I mean, I'm, I kind of just, you know, I eat whatever, I don't eat too much junk or anything like that, but, um, I just make sure that I'm always eating and not starving myself, you know, and then continuing to lift weights. Wow. So then in, in your second year at Wazoo, that's when they, they said only by your second year, they said you had a chance to make it in the NFL. When the first year they say you're terribly the worst in the bunch. Now only a year later, you have a chance in the NFL. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, the second, um, when they told me that like, Hey, it wasn't even like, Hey, you can make it to the NFL. It was like, Hey, you can take this as far as you want to take it, you know? Cause they were like, you do have potential. And even when, when the guys, um, when the strength coaches told me, you know, you're the worst of the bunch, you were in the bottom three or whatever. It wasn't because like, Hey, like I sucked as an athlete. It was no, Hey, you have all this crazy potential, you know, you, it, you yeah. just have to, you're not maximizing it right now, you know? And so that's kind of where it was like, okay, yeah, I got to maximize it. That's amazing. That's like Michael Jordan though. I'm sure you know that story. The guy was cut from his high school basketball team as a freshman, went home and cried. And then came back and worked with his coach. And I mean, the rest is history. So it's kind of a similar thing where sometimes people need that like kick in the ass, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. So tell me about um, when Gardner Minshew shows up, because he comes to the, the team at a time when there was, you know, there was a, obviously a dark period with Tyler Holinsky passing away. And then he comes in, he brings this like energy of just like humor and antics. He shows up in a red leisure shoot, suit. He's got the the mustache and all this stuff. I mean, what, what were your, what was your first reaction all, to him and all his antics? I uh, was just a different kind of dude. I mean, he's from, from Mississippi and just, you know, he had a little bit of a, a little bit of a twang and kind of the way he, he kind of operated was, it was different. You know, it wasn't like anything we had seen before. And I, I didn't, it wasn't like that big, it was like, okay, here's like another teammate, you know, this is, this is a different thing. And then, you know, he'd be in the locker room, um, in nothing but a jock strap, like doing like band stretches, just standing at his locker, just like with a straight face. And people would be looking at him like, what the hell are you doing? And he was just like, Hey, how you doing? And then like, we'll just continue doing this. It was, it was so weird to me. And I was just like, in a way it was almost like, hell yeah. Like that's my quarterback, you know, and he's doing all this like weird, funky crap, but he was a, I mean, he was a tremendous leader. I, I will say that he was, I mean, he came out to practice every day with, you know, just high energy, high intensity, and was like always trying to get better, was always trying to lead. He took care of the O-line, which I appreciated. And, you know, and he was obviously like one of the greats in Cougar history, even though he was only there for a year, you know, which really speaks levels to, uh, you know, who he was as a player and as a person. Yeah. What do you mean he took care of the O-line? What did, in what way? He, uh... He went to dinner with us a couple times, uh, bought us dinner, you know, um, never hesitated to ch shouting us out, you know, giving us props and stuff like that. And, you know, and some people do that and some people don't. And he was just one of the guys who did. And it, you know, it wasn't lost on me. I always appreciated that. Yeah. Do you still follow his career? Because it's interesting. He had such a great preseason this year, but they said that uh, they're going to give the starting job to the rookie, which I don't know. To me, it seems like I feel like Minshew's going to find his way on the field this year somehow. Oh, I mean, he's had he's had a pretty phenomenal career already. Like his numbers are, you know, pretty second to none for his like for as much, I guess, inexperience as he has. Um, I mean, but when you draft a guy, at, I don't know if it was number two or number three overall, like they did. I mean, of course, they're going to play him, you know, like that's just simply kind of how it works. Yeah, I thought they might bring him on slow, but yeah, well, I guess we'll see how that plays out. Um, so when you when you thought of, when you came back for your senior year it was it was was there a hesitation to maybe try out for the draft do you think that that helped you to come back that senior year and uh, help your draft stock yeah so i discussed with a lot of different people at that time uh what i was going to do um and a lot of people actually had told me um yeah you should leave you should go you know you've had a good enough career and and for me it was a combination of two things mainly one is that um the time i was discussing like going or trying out for the NFL after my fourth year, I felt like it was uh, like too late in the process. You know, like it was like in like January, almost February. So that would have been like really, it been a really quick turnaround, you know, and I would have, you know, had to really jump on 
you know, training for the combine, getting an invite to the combine and all this other stuff. So it would have been a lot, been a lot. And then, um, the second thing is I just felt like I wasn't ready, like mentally mm-hmm. prepped for it. Um, when I say mentally, I mean like more of like the X's and O's of football. I wanted to get another year just around that. Um, and so, you know, just made the decision to come back. I said, yeah, I can do another year in Pullman. Absolutely. I love Pullman. So, you know, I love the Cougs and it was never, it was kind of a no brainer for me at that point. That's awesome. Well, yeah, I'm glad you came back. It worked out for you. When you look back at your time in Pullman, like, is there certain games that stand up, uh, stand out to you, like the ESPN game day and the Apple Cup 2021, like those ones or any other ones that stand out to you? Yeah, so um, obviously game days up there are games that stand out. Um, You know, it was my first real, I mean, what was that, the fourth game, the fourth or the fifth game or something? Um, You know, I mean, that was my first year starting um against a very formidable opponent probably the best opponent that we had faced up to that point other than maybe sc um and so yeah i mean and just you know i didn't really i guess i didn't really understand the gravity and the effect that like game day had and you know but the way that the coups responded was pretty incredible you know like to see i mean i have a picture on my wall back here actually of of the end of the oregon game when everybody was on the field and there's so many people on the field and then if you look at um, you know the 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 amount of fans that were around the game day stage in Pullman, and you know people were waking up at two thirty in the morning to start drinking and going out and just you know just going out for the day and getting ready for the game later that day, and it was I mean it was chaotic, but it was so great. And then uh, when I was a freshman and um, I didn't play, but uh, number five USC when Sam Darnold was quarterback, and they came to town and Jihad. Um, got that strip sack at the end of the game and Derek Moore recovered it. I remember that pretty vividly. Um, and then, <clears throat> yeah, that Apple cup game too, that Apple cup was a little bit hard to enjoy just because of uh, the things that had transpired earlier that year. Um, and it was just at the end of that game, it was, I remember walking off the field uh, and talking to my buddy Liam um, and just being like, dude, like that was it. That was the end of our coup career, you know, cause uh, we both knew that we weren't going to play in the bowl game at that point. And, but it was, and it was a nice way, I guess, to cap it off, you know, just to be like, we got one apple cup at least, you know, and it, um, you know, we're the seniors and we helped to make that happen. So it's pretty. Yeah. Pretty... What, explain to me the, cause I just get so mad as a, as a fan when you guys skip the bowl games, I'm like, ah, crap. Cause then the, the bowl games, like the last, especially the last couple have been rough because so many seniors skip it. I mean, obviously it worked out well for you, but, some of the other players, like they skip it and then they don't even get drafted. I'm like, maybe they, they should have done the bowl game. It would have helped their stock. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it both ways. Um, I, I remember when I said that I wasn't going to play and I caught a lot of hate from some kook fans who were saying, Oh, you don't care about the team, this, this, and that. And I'm like, okay, well, I started 42 games straight. So <laughs> I, I definitely care about the team. Okay. Um, and it's not a question of, it's not a question of like, um, trying to be selfish or, or only looking out for myself. But like, I think what a lot of people that maybe aren't involved in the world have to understand is that, you know, when you have the opportunity to play at the highest level, even if it's just a small, like little glimmer, like you're going to take that shot, you know? And part of it is like, I mean, I don't want to discredit any bowl games, but like in my mind, if you're not, if you're not in a New York or in a New Year's, uh, like six bowl game, if you're not playing for like a national championship or something, then it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, I mean, we play, I remember we played when we played in the cheese at bowl. I mean, it was so like unorganized and like, there was so much like all this extra stuff that was going on and it just like, it made it so hard to focus on it. And it was huh. and so like towards the, and like towards the end of your career, I guess in my case, it was like, no, like I'm, going to the NFL I'm not going to risk the NFL for this one bowl game and it's not a, it's it and it's not like hey f you guys I'm out of here essentially but it's like no like I've put in my time I you know I gave my blood sweat and tears to the school and I'm not quitting early I mean the season is over I didn't leave early in the season and I told everybody like I, and I went to the coach and I said coach like I appreciate it but I'm not playing the bowl game I'm going to go get ready for the NFL it's not like I just left you know what I mean? I guess there's a little bit of like justification on my part, you know, but um, I mean, I and like I do get it both ways to where as a fan, you'd be like, oh, why don't you just, you know, stick around for another game? At the end of the day, I think it's just like personal choice, you know, because some people would say, yeah, I'm going to the NFL, but also playing the bowl game. 
I just, I mean, at the end of that, of that year with everything that had happened and, you know, just finally being like winning that Apple cup, I was just like, all right, you know, we did it. That's good enough. It's time for me to go get ready for the senior bowl in the combine. Yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, yeah, I, I totally understand that too. It's But yeah, it is frustrating as a fan, but I, I, I get it. Cause like, yeah, the other side of the coin is what if you play and you get hurt and you're like, okay, I, I played and I got hurt and I, jeopardizing my chances in the NFL for this meaningless bowl game. So I totally get that too. What do you think of the Cougs um, with the new coach with Dickert and your, any predictions for this season? I have, I mean, I went back a couple times uh, during this off season. Um, I wish I could have gotten back for uh, like during fall camp, just to see how they practice. I'm kind of, I'm a little bit in the dark for the whole season. I mean, I'd love to see them just, you know, blow it out of the water, of course. Um, but, you know, coming into this, what is this, Dickert's second year, second and a half year, I guess, technically. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on it. You know, it's like you've, you've got you've got a year's worth of foundation. You know, can you build off of it? And, you know, we'll see starting to, starting tomorrow if um, if that is the case. I assume it will be. Um, they're definitely, I mean, WSU has always been the underdog, you know, in everything. Um, so, you know, hopefully they take that underdog mentality throughout. Um, hopefully they win, you know, eight, nine games, you know, maybe, I mean, if they won more than 11 games, that would be awesome, you know, but um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I'm excited to watch them. Me too. Yeah. I'm going to the game tomorrow. So that should be fun. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of the PAC 12? Because now I don't know if you heard today, Stanford and Cal just left for the ACC. So mm-hmm. now it's just Washington state and Oregon state. There's yeah. rumors they might go to the Big 12. There's rumors that they could merge with the Mountain West. Like, do you have any thoughts on that? Or, uh, I mean, not really, honestly. Like, I mean, it, it's it's time for the it's time for the higher ups to go to work. I guess is is all I could really say about it. You know, I don't have control over it. I'm not gonna sit here and you know complain about it or anything like that. And you know, I mean, this is just another another thing that's happening, so to speak, is my whole attitude. You know, and. You know, unfortunate as as it may be with all the history and stuff. I mean, this these things do happen, right? I mean, if you look at like it used to be the Pac eight, and then it was the Pac ten, then it was the Pac twelve, and now the Pac twelve is like not around anymore. You know, so changes do happen. Um, it's gonna be up. It's gonna be up to the president and the AD uh, to make something happen, and I'm hopefully they will. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. So back to your career. So then, yeah. So talk about um, going to the draft with the Seahawks. I think it's amazing that you ran a four, was it a four, nine, two, 40 time at the combine. How did you do that? Like, did you have to prep differently for that? Like, uh, is there tricks or things that you did? Um, I mean, combine training is very specific. Um, and you train specifically for the drills that you do, you know, and that was kind of, I mean, back in the day, like that wasn't even a thing. Like, you know, people wouldn't really train for the combine. Um, I can't remember the, the guy who did it. Um, but he trained exclusively for the combine. I think it was like back in like 1987 or something. This guy decided that he was going to train exclusively for like the bench press and the 40. And he ended up getting taken in the first round because he did so well. Um, and so people started doing that more and more. And it's just like, I mean, it's, it's, I'm not going to get into like too heavy of detail. It's just very specific training. You know, I mean, you train to bench, you know, 225 as many times as you can. You train to run the fastest 40 that you can. Uh, in my case, you train for O-line drills, the O-line drills that they do. And the O-line drills that they do are pretty much the same every year. So you just train that basically for, you know, three, four months, you know, every day. And that's what you do. I forget, though, because I think a good strategy would be like, do your like do the bench press. And I don't know if you did this, but if like do the weights and stuff at your pro day and then and then don't do that at the combine, then train for like lean down and then run at the combine or vice versa. Right. I mean, couldn't you do that and kind of trick them and like, uh, yeah. So like the combine is before pro day. Um, Oh yeah. I mean, but like I, that is, I guess a strategy that some people probably use. It really just like what, what I was told by like my agent and by the guys who trained me at my agency were like, if you think that you're going to be bad at one of these drills, or one of these like testing things don't do it you know because there's been like reports of players who are like you know they're bad at something but they're super crazy competitive so they get in they do it they suck at it and it brings their stock down 
just because they're like, no, I want to do this because I, you know, I want to show them that I'm not a blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, like if you have a crap 225 bench and you're not getting the number you're supposed to get, don't do the bench. And like, I had like an okay bench, like that was, and it was good enough. You know, my 40 was like one of the better things that I had, but there was nothing that I was like super bad at to where I was like, okay, I'm not going to do it. Some other people come in there and they're like, nah, like my, my shoulder hurts. So I'm not going to bench. I mean, it's kind of a smart move because you don't want to put bad film out there, so to speak. Yeah. So do you have somebody advising you on all these decisions, like not doing the bowl game, doing this technique, like you have the, the agent advises this or who's the advisor on these things? Um, well, yeah, I mean, you go to your agent with a lot of stuff in life. I have like a very, very good agent and I'm very, he's very personable with me. He's a great guy. Um, you know, if I have questions, I'll bounce it off of him. Um, but he's also not a guy who's like necessarily going to coddle me, so to speak, you know, he's going to tell me what I need. I need to know, um, not what I need to hear necessarily. So, I mean, yeah, I got, I mean, I get good advice from him and then, but ultimately it, you know, it falls on me to make those decisions yeah i was so excited when you went to the seahawks because i watched you as a kook and i was like this guy's solid the seahawks they need help on the o-line they need you and you were solid so i was so excited now i hear your uh i was at the draft actually in vegas and i was screaming you know when they picked you but then later i think i saw the phone call it's on youtube people can watch mm -hmm. it you sound so calm in that mm -hmm. phone call are you screaming on the inside i mean you just got drafted by your home hometown uh team and you know it's like third round which is pretty good yeah that was a uh, i remember people were like this guy just doesn't even sound excited at all to be <laughs> and it was like and I, I remember i told um i told john schneider uh like a couple weeks after i got there uh he he i was with my parents my parents were there and and he came over and he, he met them and i told him like dude like i'm sorry i didn't sound more excited on the phone call i was just like those two days of like waiting to get a call were so like mentally draining and they were so I was at when he called, I was just kind of like, oh, my gosh, like it did like the calls here. It's finally happened. And I just had like zero energy left because I've been looking at my phone for three hours straight. Just like, oh, who's going to call me another time? Oh, no, they're not going to call. And then I finally get it. And it's like, remember hanging up and just being like, oh, thank God that that's over. And I know where I'm going, you know. Um, so I was absolutely I was excited. But there was just so much going. I was just trying to take everything in that it kind of just made me like speechless, you know. Yeah. Was there other teams that were interested that said they were going to draft you if, if Seattle hadn't taken you? Um, there was definitely teams that were interested. I thought I thought that I may end up at uh, Denver or Chicago was like my was the, were the places I thought I might go um, just based on like how my uh, pre-draft meeting with them went and such. I took uh, I took nine thirty visits. So I visited nine different teams within the span of like two weeks. So that was a busy two weeks, um, just meeting coaches and GMs and giving interviews and such. Um, but yeah, I mean, with that stuff, you never really know. Um, I had met with the Seahawks at the combine. Um, I had my first interview at the senior bowl was with the Seahawks. Um, and yeah, I just remember, I mean, it all kind of fell together in place, you know, my number 72, I'm 72nd overall and I'm going back to my hometown team, you know, so I can't complain. Definitely wasn't upset about it. Yeah. And what's it like? having pete carroll as a coach he seems like such a i mean maybe not as much of a character as leech but he's still i mean doesn't he have like a dj at practices does he still do that yeah i mean uh during camp there's a dj who comes to practice um but what really gets me about like a guy like him is like when he like watching him run during practice you know i mean you would never know that he's in his 70s you know because he's like running gassers he's throwing the ball and man he's just so excited every single day he's just so i mean just such a great you know guy to be around you know and you want to play for a guy like that you know and you know he's a guy who will talk to players you know he's very personable and stuff like that and I think it's great you know but while at the same time maintaining that professional head coach's attitude you know and he's had the success to back it up both at the college and the pro level absolutely were you surprised that you were able to win a starting job your first year I mean that's pretty hard for O-line to win a, a starting job I mean or did you just have that goal and you're like I'm gonna do it I don't care what it takes uh, for me, it was less about, I mean, yeah, I wanted to start, but the goal wasn't like, hey, like I have to win the starting job. The goal was like, hey, you need to get better so that you can you can ball like whenever the time comes, you know. And I mean, I remember the day they told me like, hey, you're starting. They're just like, you earned it, you know, just, you know, be cool, calm and collected about it. And like I wasn't when they told me that I wasn't like, holy crap, I'm starting. It was like, you know, to be expected, you know, because I knew like I had worked for it, you know, and I knew I had. 
I'm continuing to put the work in for it, you know, and that sort of thing. So it was like a more of a confidence thing, I guess, like uh, while trying to not be arrogant at the same time. Are you still the first one in the weight room and on the field? On the field, yeah, usually. Um, weight room's a bit different just because, you know, there's different times of the day that you work out and, you know, I do treatment and stuff, so. Okay, well, I mean, you had a great first rookie year, I think. Um, talk about uh, this game. I wanted to ask you about this. <laughs> this is so funny. In the, in the Lions game, DK Metcalf gets carted off the field. Everyone's like, oh, no, DK got hurt. And then it later comes out that he just had to go to the bathroom. Is that is that a common thing? I've never seen that while, while watching football. Like, don't the players go to the bathroom at halftime? I had never seen that either. Uh, I heard that he got fined for that. Um, but, I mean, I guess it's hard to defecate on the sidelines, so I get it. Uh, <laughs> um yeah but it typically if you gotta if you gotta relieve yourself you probably go before the game at halftime or after the game yeah well, did, did he say what did he drink too much coffee or like what caused it because it was like he said he had to get the cart because he couldn't make the walk they had to cart him because he couldn't make it <laughs> yeah I, I mean honestly i haven't asked him too much about it and i'm probably not going to um <laughs> I, I remember hearing about that and i was like oh that's why <laughs> okay uh but, you know, I guess it is what it is. Yeah. Well, you got they mic'd you up against the Chiefs. That was interesting to kind of hear, like, because I it's always interesting to hear what people are like on the field, because I think it's different. You were, like, pretty, like, keeping it strictly business during the games. Is that kind of how you are usually, or is that just because you were mic'd up, you had to calm down a little bit? No, I try to keep it that way pretty much um, all the time, um, just because it's, like, to me – I mean, some people are different. Some people can be really loose and, you know, have fun with it. And, you know, and I can, I mean, I can have fun with it. Sure. But to me, it's like, it's a very business orientated thing, um, you know, and you take it seriously. So I take it as serious as I can. Yeah. But I mean, isn't trash talk a part of the game? Does, does anybody else, I mean, you must see that in, in, in the game. Who's the biggest trash talker that you faced? <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know if I've faced like a super big trash talker like myself because I don't really say anything. Um, when we play the Rams, Jalen Ramsey obviously is a big trash talker, which makes sense because he's a corner um, and most corners do talk. Um, so I guess probably him. Um, you know, I remember back in the day watching Richard Sherman. I love Richard Sherman's trash talk. It was really funny to me. So I got to, I got a chance to meet him a little while back. So. Yeah, he's. I love that uh, the NFC Championship game. I was there when he was talking about Crabtree. That's classic stuff. But um, what about playing against Thibodeau? Because he's a he was like the fourth pick or something. And um, did they do that now? Where they they'll put the best defensive end. They'll they'll switch it and have them go both sides. Like they put him against you, thinking like, oh, you're the right tackle. You're not going to be able to hold up as well as the left tackle. Um, I mean, if you look at kind of the history of the game, the game's kind of evolved. Um, now to the point where both sides kind of see really, really good edge rushers. Um, before, like I guess back in back in the day, you know, eighties, nineties, even into the two thousands, um, the best edge rushers edge rushers typically would be on the left side, which is why left tackles get paid so much money. Um, but now the game's kind of evolving to where there's two pretty dynamite like edge rushers. Like if you look at like the Raiders, for example. Um, you have you have a guy like Chandler Jones and then a guy like Max Crosby, and they both line up on the left and the right side, obviously. Or like, um, you know, teams will switch, like the Cowboys with Micah Parsons will switch back and forth from the left to the right side. You know, it just depends on the scheme that they dial up for that week. Yeah, so like how do you prepare for that? Um, because it sounds like you're working to get better and with hand plates and inside all the X's and O's about it, but and the techniques, but you're working to to be prepared for those edge rushers. Yeah, I mean, it's just a question it sounds cliche but it's just watching film and you know trying to give or get tips you know as much as you can to uh, prepare yourself the best for you know what's to come that week yeah i don't know if you've ever like googled yourself but like i typed your name into youtube and like the second video down is this guy called the football scout and he did a whole video he loves you he says you're, you're going to be going to the pro bowl and you're going to be one of the best tackles in the nfl like do you agree with that is that your goal to get the pro bowl this year I mean, yeah, it's, that was my goal last year, too. I mean, for me, it's like, you know, set the set the standard super, super high. You know, that way you have so much room to achieve. And, you know, so, of course, like, why wouldn't I try to do that? You know, I 
I mean, I'm playing for a reason. I'm not playing just to play and I'm not playing for money, you know, none of that stuff. You know, you play to be play for respect and you play to be good at what you do. So of course that would be a goal. Yeah. Are you, and how's the knee? Cause I think they said you, you had a knee injury last year, right? And everything's uh, healed up. Yeah. I'm not really at Liberty to talk about injuries too much. I would get fined. Um, but yeah, I'm feeling oh, good. Really? That's a, I didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we'll move on. <laughs> well, Appreciate how's the it. season? What do you think about the team for the Seahawks this year? Like, I mean, cause you guys have a solid O-line bookend tackles with yourself and Charles Cross. You have three stud receivers, two stud running backs and a pro bowl QB. I mean, I feel like the off- offense should be clicking. Yeah. I mean, it should be a, it should be a good solid year for us. You know I mean? Went in with the same mindset last year and, you know, trying to go with an even better mindset this year. And, you know, we got a good, a very good defense too, as well, you know, with the guys up front and you know, obviously having uh, Bobby Wagner back um, commanding the defense, you know, um, and then you got guys, you know, coming from the, the third level in Quandary Diggs and Julian Love. So it should be great. That's awesome. And then are you, what about um, with music, back to the music, um, is there any concerts that you're planning to see this year? Or like, uh, I mean, you're still playing the guitar, right? Of course, yeah. Do you ever get to jam with any of the Seattle bands? Like you ever like try to hook up with Allison Chains and just have like a jam session or anything? Oh, uh, no, I've never tried to do that. Um my guitar playing is kind of on and off just because it gets so busy during the week. So, you know, sometimes I'm really on it. Sometimes I'm really off of it. And that's just because, you know, the job and, you know, duty calls and in the off season, I definitely play a lot more. Um, so, yeah, I mean, is there certain songs or do you have like, like a specific warm up song that you play before games or is it always different? I have a pretty specific playlist that I play. It's like my football pregame playlist. It's just a bunch of like hardcore heavy metal stuff. Really? Do you, is that public? Can people download that? Um, I could make it public if it was requested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be interested to hear that. That'd be that'd be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'd yeah. be cool. I love. It sounds like you have some pretty good taste. I'm still just fascinated that you like all these old bands. It's really cool. Do you? Is there any new bands that you're discovering that that are that fit your taste? There's a newer band that I um, one of my coaches actually showed me recently, or relatively recently showed me last year um they're from new zealand they're a band called alien weaponry um and they're like uh maori so they have the um like you'll you'll see them they have like the face tats and stuff of like uh, the maori people uh from new zealand and they're like a pretty and they take their um maori language and they speak the native language in their music and it's pretty good you know okay alien weaponry you said alien weaponry yeah okay wow i'll have to check that out awesome well what about the oh, last thing I want to ask you about, too, was the uh, are you still doing the jujitsu? I don't do it during the season simply because um, it's a you know bit of a hassle. Um, and, you know, I, I take time in the evening to try to study as much film as I can. Um, I did it in the off season, um, and then I got into boxing this off season too. Um, when I had surgery on my shoulder, I had to stop doing jujitsu just because, you know, it's need time to recover so i'll be back in it probably next off season because you said that would be your backup career is ufc i mean do you think that's something you would do after nfl oh i i I mean it would be cool but i'm not definitely not experienced enough or something like that it's like i do it because i like it you know now i would love don't get me wrong like i think sparring somebody would be a lot of fun um, but I'm not at liberty to say that I would be a good mixed martial arts fighter because I've only, t- I've only done it on and off for a couple of years now. So, yeah. But, and did you worry too, that you could get hurt doing something like that? Like that's, that would be my fear. Oh, I would probably get hurt. I mean, you know, that's kind no, of but like, if you do it in the off season and you get hurt, then that could jeopardize your football career. Right. I mean, yeah, but you know, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't really think of like jujitsu or boxing being like super super dangerous you know because i'm not in like an active competition you know so like when somebody somebody heel hooks me you know when i'm rolling around with them on the mat and i tap they stop you know what i mean as opposed to like a competition where somebody's going you know 100 percent, you know then there's a chance for greater injury so to speak it's sort of like when uh, nfl players are in the pro bowl they don't go 100 <laughs> percent. exactly <laughs> Very cool. Well, hey, I'll let you get going. I always end up promoting a charity, though. Is there is there a charity that you want to promote here at the end? Um, I when I was a kid, I really liked uh, the work of St. Vincent de Paul, who's like a lot of like, I guess, uh, helping for people maybe on the 
lower end of like income and you know need a lot of other stuff they do a lot of work with homeless and stuff so i like them as an organization yeah that's great i love that people can throw a few bucks there i know that's a, a big issue uh in my hometown of seattle which i'm sure you've seen and I, I hope that uh that gets you know with these kinds of organizations we can hopefully fight some of that it's just it's tough to see right absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and you're same is Saint Vincent de Paul. That's I'm assuming that's a Catholic organization because I know you're Catholic, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. still practicing. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I heard it was crazy. I heard you say because I, I grew up, I was raised Catholic, and um, I had to go to. Conf I remember going to confession when I was like ten and being so scared and like thinking I got to like trying to think of something to say. Did you? I heard you say you go to confession once a week. Did you ever right. like? You seem like such a good guy. Is it ever like hard to come up with something to confess or? Uh, when I was a kid, yeah. Uh, now it rolls off pretty easy. And like, my whole thing is like, you know, <laughs> there's a good chance that the priest that you're talking to has probably heard somebody say that they've murdered somebody else. So it's definitely not the worst thing that he's heard. You know, I mean, because people come from all walks of life. And there's a chance that a priest has sat there with somebody who said, yeah, like, you know, 20 years ago, I killed somebody, I just got out of prison or something like that. So, you know, you're probably not doing as bad as you think you are. <laughs> you know, so right. that's, no, there's nothing really for me to worry about. Yeah, well, you're doing great, awesome work. Love to watch you play. Go Hawks Appreciate and go Cougs. Go Hawks, go Cougs. All right, see you, Abe. See you, Chuck. Bye-bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the full podcast episode. Please help support our guests by following them on social media and purchasing their products, whether it be a book, album, film, or other thing. And if you have a few extra dollars, please consider donating it to their favorite charity. If you want to support the show, you can like, share, and comment on this episode on social media and YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can give us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Finally, make sure you're subscribed to the show on YouTube for the video versions and other exclusive content. We appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.